2022. If you haven't yet, please subscribe in all our channels, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and Apple Podcasts. You can also listen to us on your smart speaker. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and a review. It will help us out tremendously. You, uh, we're also on online radio, and you can visit us on the sportscast.net. Also, you can, you can download our app, the Sportscast. This month is the World Cup. Things are steaming up, and I brought in two special guests that they wrote a book on Messi versus Ronaldo. Most of you guys know these two uh, players, and the authors are Joshua Robinson and Jonathan Clegg. Welcome to the Sportscast. Thanks for having Thanks. us. Thanks for having us. Yep. So let's begin. Uh, what got you guys to write this book, Messi uh, uh, versus Ronaldo? So we, we had written a previous book about the rise of the Premier League um, and how it really took over the world from, you know, something that, uh, that, that was only formed in 1992. And from there, I think you could look at, um, you know, that explained the rise of the most powerful league. And to us, it was time to kind of examine the careers of the most powerful players, you know, the guys who really shaped this entire era, because it's not a it's not a double biography of these guys. It's not just about their achievements on the field. It's really about looking at how their their mere presence and their their impact uh, on the two of the biggest clubs in soccer really rippled out across the whole game and the business. Jonathan, um, your experience writing this book, what uh, caught your attention? Well, um, yeah, I think, you know, um, I think when we set out, we um, we knew that Messi and Ronaldo were obviously the dominant uh, players of the last 20 years. And we knew that they'd had huge impact on the game. But I don't think we realized, you know, quite um, when we set out, quite how much sort of all the developments that have happened in soccer over the last, you know, two decades could be traced back to them, how, how they sort of worked as these two uh, forces of gravity in the game, almost like reshaping the soccer universe. Um, and so I think, you know, when you look at things like the upcoming world cup in Qatar, which, you know, uh, this is a tournament that's being staged in the middle of the desert in the middle of the, you know, in the middle of the European uh, soccer season, uh, the first time ever the World Cup is being played in November. It's a crazy uh, situation, and yet if you when you break it down, it's um you know you can you can sort of trace a lot of that a lot of uh, how we got here to the careers of Messi and Ronaldo and how they sort of transformed the entire uh, business and ecosystem of of soccer. Um, so I think yeah, that just how far-reaching their impacts were, how ex how it extended so far beyond the field um, and the trophy rooms of the clubs that they played for, um, was something that uh, only when we started piecing things together did we realize you know quite how big their impact had been. Lionel uh, Lionel Messi from Argentina, Cristiano Ronaldo from Portugal. Um, tell us about their upbringings and the similarities and the uh, uh, differences from the two. You know, they, I mean, they grew up 5,000 miles away in, in two vastly different countries, but they're, the similarity for both of them, I think, is that they were both kind of outsiders. Um, you know, Messi is not from Buenos Aires. He's from three hours north of there in Rosario. Uh, and his whole life was told he was undersized and then moved to, to Barcelona when he was uh, 12 years old. And, you know, there he was not like the like the kids who usually came through the Barcelona Youth Academy. He was uh, mocked mercilessly by his by his teammates for his Argentine accent. He was very quiet. Um, and the same was true of, of Cristiano, who grew up in Madeira, uh, which is an island in the middle of the Atlantic. And he, it, you know, closer to Morocco than to Portugal. Um, and he moved to Lisbon to go play for Sporting Lisbon also around the age of 12 and same thing had a different accent. He was seen as, you know, kind of a, a, you know, kid from, from the backwaters. Uh, and so I think in, in many ways that spurred them on. And, and that's one of the real similarities between them uh, at, at that stage of their careers, even though they, they went on to have vastly different approaches to the game. Can you tell us about their agents? I know you had a chapter on the two Georges. Um, 
what was the whole like the beginning when they got into the clubs of Barcelona? And uh, I mean, obviously, Ronaldo went to Man United first, but I think before that, I think he went to a club in Portugal. But tell us about once they hit professional uh, clubs. Yeah, I mean, um, you could argue that their um, agents, um, Cristiano Ronaldo's uh, longtime agent, uh, George Mendes, and um, Messi's agent is his father, uh, Jorge Messi. Uh, you could argue that their impact has been like almost as big as their as their clients, because um, certainly uh, George Mendes um, has gone from you know he he was a video store clerk before he got into the business of um, soccer, uh, being a soccer agent. Um, he had sort of um, dabbled in. Uh, with some sort of uh, slightly lower tier players. But when he hitched his um, ride to Ronaldo and um, sort of followed the comet that was Cristiano Ronaldo's career, um, in the process, George Mendes transformed himself into arguably the most powerful figure in world football. He now literally masterminds entire club's transfer strategies. He has um, a you know, host of clients that he kind of moves around, switching between different teams each off season, like he's moving pieces on the chessboard. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, as much as um, as much as as Cristiano Ronaldo has has um, you know changed the game, um, a lot of that has come through his agent, who has you know sort of harnessed the power of Ronaldo's uh, success and popularity and um, turned himself into this. Um, hugely powerful figure. Um, Jorge Messi didn't have quite the same level of ambition as um, as as George Mendes. Uh, he was sort of solely focused on looking after his son. But the two of them um, together really transformed the entire business of um, professional soccer. And um, and yeah, that's one of the the abs- the lasting legacies of of Ronaldo. Long after Cristiano Ronaldo has retired, George Mendes will still be. Uh, pulling the strings uh, behind some of Europe's biggest clubs. Yeah, uh, George Mendes has dealt with uh, bigger players as well, uh, James Rodriguez and some others. So he definitely has made a name for himself. Not sure if George Messi is going to be agent to other players, but we'll see. Um, how much of an impact has these guys, uh, that these two players uh, have made for their club, revenue and just global outreach? Uh, it's sort of been a double-edged sword. I think... Um you know, no one would dispute that for the better part of the, you know, the 2000s and 2010s, they lifted clubs to, to unprecedented heights. I mean, Messi was, uh, a, the, you know, one of the key pieces of arguably the best side, the best club side in the history of football, which was Guardiola's Barcelona. Um, and then, you know, later on, as Real Madrid was rattling off Champions League titles, Ronaldo was at the center of that. Um, but the other side of it is that because they were so good for so long and the clubs felt a responsibility to continue uh, signing major stars to give them chances to win and in the process indebted themselves to you know the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, by the time Messi left Barcelona, their debt was over a billion dollars. Um, and so there's an element of looking back on that period and wondering, you know, was it all worth it? Because the the clubs have in a very real sense mortgaged their futures to capitalize on the the primes of uh, Messi and Ronaldo. How about La Liga? Uh, you know, obviously like the Premier League is the biggest league in the world right now, but how much of an impact when those two players were in La Liga, how much did it help La Liga get noticed uh, all around the world? Yeah, I mean, it certainly helped um spanish football um you know on the field um you know as josh said you know for for, for the late tw- 2000s early 2010s um you know barcelona and real madrid were the two dominant clubs in the world in fact um they became almost like world all-star teams um because they were led by messi and ronaldo but um everyone in the game knew that that um to, to win the champions league you had to kind of be either playing with Messi or Ronaldo. And so a whole host of the, um, you know, world's top players came to join Messi and Ronaldo and and to sort of piggyback on their success by um, playing alongside them. So, uh, yeah, you know, the on-field product was, um, was elevated by them, like, to a huge degree. I mean, they are by far the most famous players um, on the planet. 
perhaps the most famous players to have ever existed. And um, and so all that uh, brought a spotlight onto La Liga that hadn't been there before. Now, the, the question is, how much did La Liga capitalize on the Messi-Ronaldo era? Um, because it um, it it was already lagging behind the Premier League in terms of the revenues that its um, teams were um, bringing in every season. And even though Real Madrid and Barcelona could compete with the Premier League's big guns, the rest of the league were also rans in terms of you know the, the actual business of soccer. And I think when you look back, you could argue that um, La Liga really kind of failed to capitalize on the Messi-Ronaldo era because... Um, even though some changes have happened and there is more revenue sharing than there was in the past. And, you know, that was sort of the premier league secret source in, in a way was, was to divide all its revenue between its 20 clubs uh, to ensure kind of top to bottom competitiveness. And, um, and that, you know, brought in a, a viewers and made every game kind of appointment viewing. Um, La Liga hasn't done that to quite the same degree. I think to a large you know, portion of of soccer fans it's still like real madrid barcelona and then everyone else and they don't really you know um uh, have a strong sense of the the other clubs that make up the the spanish top flight but um so yeah so i think you could argue that that um that la liga didn't really kind of capitalize on that era as it might have done did you guys ever figure out if they had a relationship with each other did they you know have you know past text messages or did they hang out during the off season? What did you guys figure out there? Uh, they they very clearly don't have a <laughs> relationship. <laughs> um, they they don't seem to particularly like each other all that much. Um, I mean, sir, that was, I think that was certainly true earlier in their careers. Now there's there appears to be a, a healthy respect, and it was at an awards show in Monaco in 2019 where they were sitting next to each other, and Ronaldo mentioned almost in passing that he and Messi had never sat down to a meal together. Um, so that's, you know, it, but it's, they don't really need to have a relationship for people to construct the narratives that, uh, that they want to project onto them. Um, and it's certainly not like they're in the same place all that much either, you know, over the course of their careers, they've been on the same pitch, maybe three dozen times. It's very different from some of the classic rivalries we've seen in other sports. You know, if you have a rival in the NBA, you might play them, you know, a, a dozen times in a season, uh, you know, between the regular season and a long playoff series. Um, Roger and Rafa, for instance, were uh, inhabited the same tennis circuit for two decades and were, um, you know, might have faced off in uh, Grand Slams four times a year. So it's, um, it's one of those things where the rivalry kind of mushroomed from not all that much actual, you know, shared moments. Something to definitely compare um, to American sports, American leagues. Uh, what what other two players in the States in the past or maybe present that you compare Messi versus Ronaldo? Um, you, you mean to um, to stars in other sports? Yeah, yeah, correct. NBA, yeah. NFL. Or... Yeah, well, I think um, so Ronaldo is a, a pretty obvious one, I think. Um, like I, I, Ronaldo is basically Kobe Bryant, but the soccer version. Um, insane um, level of competitiveness, um, absolute dedication to, um, you know, uh, being in peak physical condition, you know, for Kobe's like, you know, 2 a.m. shoot arounds read Ronaldo's like 3 a.m. ice baths. They're both just like maniacally competitive um, guys who also kind of had that thing of like, I'm the best player. You, you know, I'm the best player. I know I'm the best player and there's nothing you can do to stop me. They, they both sort of had embodied that same attitude. Um, Messi, you know, uh, we, we, we talked about this just the other day. Me Messi is a kind of trickier one to pin down. I think, you know, Steph Curry, maybe um, as a guy who, you know, doesn't, look like a lot of the other kind of like basketball unicorns we got at the moment but um still is it was able to kind of um mold the nba to his game um i think there's like some patrick mahomes in in um messi just in terms of like playing in in a way that we've not never really seen before and with a kind of in a style that kind of just um you know, it ev evokes a lot of joy in people who watch, you know, Mahomes is just like fun to watch and, and Messi's the same. Um, so 
yeah, so somewhere in that Steph Curry, Patrick Mahomes sphere is 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 Messi. Well enough. After they left La Liga, of course, uh, Messi went to PSG. Ronaldo went to Juventus for a season, then to Man United. How do you see the careers right now? We're very much in the sort of the uh, the twilight. Um, it's you know for even for Messi's resurgence right now this season at PSG last year made for difficult watching. Um, and, you know, we, we don't know really how sustainable this run of form is right now because he's, you know, peaking. Uh, he's, he's done everything so that he can peak at the World Cup. Uh, for Cristiano Ronaldo, it's much clearer that this is the end. Um, you know, he can't even get in the starting lineup at Man United right now. I think it's pretty certain that he'll leave. Um, and then where he'll go is, is a real mystery because we know he wants to play on a Champions League club. There don't seem to be that many Champions League clubs that, that can actually offer him a home right now. Um, so it's, you know, there will be, I think, moves for both of them in the nearest future. Um, you know, the latest rumor is that Messi would possibly make the jump to MLS with Inter Miami, um, which would be a signal to everyone that this is really it. Um, and and Cristiano will move on too. So this is, you know, but I think for both of them, the, the focus, the past 18 months or so has really been on getting to this world cup and taking one last shot at the title that neither of them has. Yeah. Uh, Ronaldo has won uh, the Euro cup and, uh, and then Messi won the Copa America, uh, both from the confederations. They want that one title to be in the same line as Ronaldo, Messi and Zidane. Um, let's stick with that. Where do you guys see Messi um, ending up MLS staying in PSG or maybe go back to uh, La Liga? I think that's it. I think those three options, one of those will turn out right. I I, I mean, I, I, um, I, I struggle to see him staying at PSG. Um, if I'm honest. Um, and I had, I had thought that there, that a, a return to Barcelona would be in the cards, but it does sound like, um, the, the Miami rumor has some legs and, um, you know, I could definitely see the, the, the sort of mooted inclusion of like an ownership stake in the team being something that would be of interest to Messi, because, you know, I think when you look at what's what their careers will hold beyond their playing days, I don't really see either of them getting into coaching, um, especially Messi. It's hard to imagine him, um, you know, as a, not the most communicative person at the best of times, um, you know, becoming the the, the, the manager and, and, and public face of a, of a soccer club. Um, so I think the ownership stake, you know, is the sort of thing that might um, persuade Messi that now's the time to make the move to MLS. I, I, you know, I think a lot of it will depend on what happens at the World Cup. You know, if, if Messi wins the World Cup with Argentina, which is definitely possible, um, I would imagine he will retire from international football. And then... That, that 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 sort of thing makes a move to um MLS um you know easier because um the pressure to be playing at the very like top of the game would probably not be quite so strong. A tough prediction is Ronaldo. Obviously, they leave. there's been rumors about Lisbon, perhaps Asia. Um for the United States, I've been hearing that court case, the like the the other person uh, uh, appealed it. So maybe MLS is like less of a chance. But what have you heard about Ronaldo? Uh, well, Ronaldo is very much at the end of the road. So it's, he's, you know, I think he definitely is focused on taking, you know, padding his numbers in the champions league. Um, so, you know, if, if there is a possible return to Lisbon, that would make a lot of sense. He'd have to take a huge pay cut, but, um, you know, maybe he has a change of heart and decides that the chance to bang in a few more in, in the group stage of the champions league is worth it. Um, there's they should give not- him part of the team. They should give him part of the team too. <laughs> part of sporting. <laughs> he'd, he'd automatically increase their uh, their transfer budget many times <laughs> over. Um, there's been a Napoli rumor as well, so you know that's that could be a possibility as a maybe as a rental, effectively, you know, six months or, or a year. Um, so I think I think the future is is murkier for him, although he you know even though he's what 37 now he probably wants to stick around for at least the euros and then call it a day yeah the thing with ronaldo is 
that like even as his um powers are clearly on the wane there's still he still has that stardust that, that some you know most european soccer clubs are owned by complete maniacs and one of them will want that to sprinkle some of that ronaldo stardust on their team and get the like 400 million instagram followers and yada yada because um you know he still um yeah the spotlight follows him and and you know that that for, for, for many clubs perhaps not the the, the very top tier that, that cristiano ronaldo is looking at but like for the ones slightly lower down like napoli for instance um you know ronaldo would do a lot to um just raise the profile of the club globally um which you know in 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 um you know today is it, it means a lot for, for some of those clubs yeah we'll definitely see what happens um now going to the closing part of the show uh what do you want people to get out of this book i think for us what what we'd like people to take away is not just a better understanding of uh you know what made has made Messi and Ronaldo so great and ultimately so similar, even though they're portrayed as, as polar opposites. Um, I think what we hope the people take away from the book is also a, a larger understanding of the mechanics of European soccer and how, you know, decisions by just a couple of clubs around a couple of players can have an impact that, you know, reshapes and occasionally uh, threatens to revolutionize the game. Um, you know, it was, it was after, those years of really profligate spending by uh, by Barcelona and Real Madrid, that they found themselves in in dire financial straits and needing to push for a project like the Super League. Um, so all of these things are connected, and and that's one of the main points we wanted to make in the book. How yeah. about you, Jonathan? E- yeah, even I think even if you feel like you have followed the careers of Messi and Ronaldo, even if you can kind of recall the times they faced each other and their like most impressive moments on the field i i think that what we hope that this book will do is um you know really kind of explain everything beyond that right everything off the field we we really hope to illuminate the kind of worlds these guys inhabit how much they um transformed the game their clubs um they crossed paths with some of the most wild colorful characters in the game um and i think if you want to really understand modern football um, messi and ronaldo are like the perfect vehicle to do that this this book really explains where we are why why the why why um you know wh- where we are right now wh- where the game is headed and um you know how much messi and ronaldo have been responsible for that trajectory so even if you feel like you know their stories, I think there's still a ton in here. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of news that's come out of the book already. But, um, yeah, there's just I think there's just a ton in here that people will um, will will learn. Yeah, a lot of behind the scenes. Definitely recommend the book. Um, in closing, what is the best way to get the book and also your contact information? The book is available anywhere books are sold. So, you know. Barnes and Noble, Amazon, all the usual spots. And uh, you can follow us on Twitter. I'm Josh Robinson23. And I'm at Clegg John, C L E G G J O N. And before we go, any of the current young players, the Mbappes, um, let's say, I, I can't think of anyone else but Mbappe right now, but anyone else you see right now that could potentially hit that Ronaldo Messi level? The other obvious one I think at the moment is is Erling Holland. Um, and what's funny about the Mbappe about the Messi Ronaldo period is that we've kind of come to expect that you know it's not enough to have one great player uh, at a time. You have to have them tw- two at a time. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of people want a lot of fans want to see Holland versus Mbappe become a kind of Messi versus Ronaldo situation, but they've got a really long way to go. It's uh, it's not just the the absolute height of you know some of the eighty and ninety goal seasons that they had in La Liga. It's also about just doing it for more than a decade. How about you, Jonathan? Yeah, no, I think that's right. Uh, I think Mbappe and 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 Holland are the the natural um sort of successes whether they reach the same heights I, I, I don't know but um but yeah they also have the same um dynamic with 
Messi and Ronaldo, who are kind of polar opposites, where Mbappe is all about speed and Haaland is all about strength. So that kind of makes that sort of uh, brings the same kind of dynamic to the to their rivalry, which will be really fun to to, uh, to watch. You know, the the one the one issue that um, Erling Haaland has is that he is Norwegian, so um, you know he's not his country does not qualify for the World Cup that often, and you know, just purely by dint of that, it's hard to imagine you know his um, career re- re- reaching the same you know level because um, you know huge part of their um success and popularity and achievements have been on the world stage so um yeah we'll see there you have it joshua robinson and jonathan clegg with the book messi versus ronaldo you can find the link below in the description guys thanks uh very much for coming on to the sportscast thanks for having us really appreciate it thank you and, and let's